Well, hide your Jedi friends. This is episode 66 of the Family Answer Man podcast. And today we're looking at Christians and Wicca from a biblical worldview on the Family Answer Man podcast. I'm your host, David Orges, and I'm here with Dr. Mark Crosby, pastor, educator, marriage and family therapist, and our resident expert on the Family Answer Man podcast, where we tackle tough questions that families face and discuss practical solutions that really do work. So this podcast is not a therapy session, and we're not able to give specific advice to your situations, but we do believe that mental health and spiritual health are very serious issues and family dynamics can be and often are very complicated. So for in-depth answers to your questions, we do encourage you to seek professional counsel specific to your unique circumstances. Now, if you would take just a second to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell so you will never miss an episode of The Family Answer Man. And if you're listening via podcast, take a moment to follow, to rate and review us on your favorite podcast app. It really does help us out and we would greatly Greatly appreciate that. Uh, also, if our content has helped you at all, go ahead and share the Family Answer Man with your friends and with your family so that they can join you on this journey of building stronger, healthier, and happier families. Well, Dr. Mark, yes. uh, good to be here today with you. And uh, we have what I think is going to be a very interesting topic oh, for yeah. a lot of people. We're talking yeah. about Christians and Wicca. Um, and Maybe you can give us a little um, background. Is this something that is new uh, in the world that that Christians and, and Wicca are kind of coming into contact, bump, bumping right. together, or is this is this something that's been around for a while? Right, and we'll unpack more of that in just a few moments. But the reality is that Wicca came, or the Wicca movement, uh, the religious ideology of of Wicca, which in some circles is pronounced Wicca. Anyway, uh, came into prominence uh, in. The United States, Australia, and New Zealand, probably in the early to mid 1960s. Okay, it's a old, revived, uh, many will argue, pre-Christian uh, religion that basically was revived, if you will, uh, in the early to mid 1900s. And so, again, it's basically made its mark. It's very fast growing. You see it especially uh, in areas such as New Mexico, Arizona. Uh, Nevada, of course, California. Uh, you'll see it in other parts uh, of, of the country, but primarily in, in those areas where you have a lot of pluralistic beliefs as far okay. as religion and faith, et cetera. Uh, it's made its way, of course, in the Bible Belt. And so there mm-hmm. are people in uh, the state of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, you know, Florida, Arkansas, et cetera, Texas, that, again, you're starting to see this movement occurring. And the reality is that you're seeing this movement uh, growing uh, as the mainline churches are shrinking. Mm. And we'll unpack yeah. that more in just a few moments. Okay. But the reality is as mainline churches shrink, these other movements like Wicca uh, are beginning to uh, experience numerical growth. Uh, because again, a lot of people find it interesting. They find it fascinating. Mm. And some will even say it's basically what they kind of were believing all along, or maybe were taught to believe in whatever church they, they grew up in. Meaning that they really cannot, unfortunately, uh, look at the differences or realize the differences between Christianity and the Wicca movement, which is, you know, like light and darkness. Mm. But anyway, and that unfortunately is a testimony to our, 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 some of our mainline churches and what they're right. teaching and, and sharing. But anyway, we'll, we'll unpack that more in a, in a few moments. But the reality is that, yes, it's growing. It's been around uh, for about 50 to 60 years, uh, and it continues to be growing as the mainline churches are shrinking. Okay. Well, and I think that's a, a good perspective to look at this from, and, and knowing that um, if you don't have a good, solid foundation right. uh, of what you believe, right. then uh, maybe some things can sound good and interesting right. and uh, may not be, as Paul said, the gospel that we first were told. Exactly. So uh, that brings us to the question for the day on Family Answer Man. And if you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can email us at familyanswerman at liveoak.church, familyanswerman at liveoak.church. Uh, we would love to hear from you and have your questions that we can answer for you. The question for today comes in, says, my son was raised in church, baptized, and served as a volunteer. And and he is now dating a woman who claims to be a Wiccan. She said that she loves nature, she does no harm, and believes in a divine energy. My pastor says that they're devil worshipers, but she says that's not true. All I want is for my son to be happy, but now he seems really confused. What is all of this about, and what can we do? Yeah, so this, again, is becoming perhaps more common than many people realize or really want to admit to. 
And that is we're starting to see more and more uh, of this uh, movement, this Wiccan movement, finding its way into mainline circles, mainline uh, uh, social, you know, gatherings, if you will, and finding its way, you know, into universities and schools and other settings. And so the chances are very high that you'll run into someone who is either embracing it, practicing Wiccan, embracing Wiccan, or interested in it. Okay. And so, and the reason, again, as we said earlier, is that many mainline churches have lost, I will argue, their evangelistic push, their evangelistic effort, their evangelistic motivation. And because of that, uh, many, unfortunately, are hearing the message that basically says, all religions are the same. It uh, doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Uh, who's to say who's right, who's wrong? You can have your truth. I can have my truth. And they're hearing that not only, unfortunately, from the pulpit in many cases, but also in universities. Right. And so with that being said, <clears throat> the mainline churches are now shrinking. Uh, some mainline churches have made it very clear that they have not had an increase in membership in decades. Right. Some since they were founded. Some since, the, exactly, since they were founded. And so what's happening is, is that with this shrinking of your mainline churches, now your fastest growing group uh, are called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Not the N-U-N-S. Exactly, but the N-O-N-E-S, the nuns. And so what's happening is these people are saying, I don't affiliate with any particular denomination, any particular church, any particular belief system. And whenever that happens, that creates a spiritual vacuum. Yeah. Causing people to begin to be more open to various movements, to be more curious about various movements, to be more willing to uh, pursue uh, maybe what their friend or their coworker or their girlfriend is now experiencing. And so for some of some people, that's the Wiccan movement. <clears throat> now, Wicca is an old English word for the word witch or sorcerer. And again, in many circles, it's pronounced witcha, but both pronunciations, I think, would suffice. But it became popular in the 1960s here in the United States, even though it started primarily in England uh, in the early to mid 20th century okay. uh, by a man named Gerald Gardner. Uh, he was interested in the occult. He was interested in other uh, ancient practices. And basically what he began to do, he began to explore, uh, if you will, some of the various uh, movements in the occult. And in 1939, he became associated with a coven and created this new diverse tradition uh, called the Wiccan uh, movement, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, their beliefs, and their practices, again, are all over the place. Um, some are monotheistic, means they believe in some sort of goddess. Uh, some are polytheistic, which means they believe in a duality, uh, both a male and female deity. Uh, some are atheistic. So their beliefs really are all over the place. There is no real particular uh, scriptural basis for which they say things or do things. So nothing that's centralized, nothing that's well-defined. Not really. Not really. Now, Gardner did write uh, a book, basically, that has been copied a few times. But again, they're very eclectic, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, they primarily believe uh, in reincarnation at death. Uh, they believe in karma. Uh, they believe that if you do good, you'll come back, if you will, uh, a as a witch. And so that's kind of their primary belief. They believe in magic and the, primarily the manipulation of nature. Uh, many of them find themselves in covens of 13. Uh, and generally there's a high priestess that basically operates and manages uh, the coven, if you will. Uh, many pastors, and rightly so, see this group or see this movement as a satanic group. However, they do not see themselves, interestingly enough, as a satanic group. Right, and that's they, a lot it, of the pushback that you right. get. Right. If, if, if you call a Wiccan uh, a Satanist, they'll push back and say, no, uh, Satanism is a rejection of authority. It's a product of rebellion. It's a product of nonconformity. Uh, if you try to place them in a uh, traditional uh, Christian biblical viewpoint of Satan, they will say simply that's a Christian construct, etc. And so they, they kind of push away from that. Uh, the point is their philosophy and their theology do not line up with the Word of God. So no matter how you try to slice it, no matter how you try to mask it, no matter how much you try to incorporate it into anything to do with Christianity, it is like mixing light with darkness. There, there's, no, there's no mixing. Uh, so what happens, uh, if you will, when you start getting involved, as this person is, uh, romantically, uh, you begin to have a lot of questions about your own faith. And in many cases, uh, what happens is if the Christian is not 
going to be evangelistic in this relationship, if they're not going to share their beliefs, they're not going to encourage the person they're seeing uh, to come to church with them or to read the Bible with them or to hear the gospel, then what's going to happen is the opposite is going to occur. Mm -hmm. And that's perhaps what's happening in this particular case. Uh, this young man, according to, to this question, uh, was, was raised in the church, baptized, served as a volunteer, all these things. But for some reason, like so many today, especially in mainline churches, they begin to walk away from their faith. They begin to no longer understand or embrace or even know some of the basic tenets of their faith or even understand why they are a Christian. You know, I'm asked, you know, so many people, you know, just, you know, as, as you know, a counselor, as a pastor, uh, and sometimes just as a, a teacher in a, in a group of people, why are you a Christian? Great question. And many will say, well, that's just how I was raised. Mm-hmm. You know, or some will say, you know, that's just, you know, um, I've, al I've always believed, you know, or I, I was always, you know, been in the church. And the problem with that, even though there's nothing wrong with being raised in the church, of course, being raised or, or, or having a family that was Christian, the concern, though, I shouldn't say a problem, but the concern is if that's all you have, then how do you defend your faith when someone comes against you and says, well, I wasn't raised in the church, so, so there. You know, I wasn't raised in a Christian family, so there. Right, or have uh, an argument that sounds really good, maybe it's really convincing, right. sounds appealing. Right? Yeah, and, and, or they'll say, well, the only reason why you're a Christian is because you were raised in the church. And they will begin to challenge and say, what if, you know, you were raised, you know, in an atheistic home? Would you be an atheist or, or whatever? So it's very familiar to, uh, did God really say? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And so the point is, is that, is that when, when, when these two groups come together, especially romantically, if the Christian is not prepared to defend the faith, to share the faith, to know what they believe and why— then in many cases, people who are in these movements or people who are part of various cults, if you will, can and will turn the Christian into knots theologically and philosophically. Mm. And so this is why, again, it's very important for all believers, uh, especially someone who's maybe in the stage of life where you are looking for a life partner, you're looking to get married one day, you're dating, you're in college, maybe you're even high school, whatever, and you begin to again, run into individuals who have differing views, different uh, perspectives, different religious beliefs, and some not just different, but diametrically opposed to where you are. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves to see where we are in our faith. Examine yourself. And I think, um, I think there's a, not enough examination, if you will, uh, personal self-examination mm -hmm. in, in our life and our walk with the Lord to see where am I in my faith? Yeah. You know, what what do I believe? Why do I believe this? Mm. You know, why do I believe I was created by God and for God? Why do I believe that? Why do I believe Jesus rose from the grave? Why do I believe the Bible's true? You know, and so because in today's world, again, a few click of the keys on your computer, you go on the internet, go on YouTube, whatever, and you will hear, you know, hundreds of people give reasons why they don't believe the Bible. Or hundreds of reasons why they don't believe in God, or hundreds of reasons why they don't follow Jesus. And so if you do not, as a believer, as a Christian, know what you believe and why, you'll be taken down all sorts of different trails, if you will. And especially if you are involved romantically. Now, notice in this question, uh, this this young lady says, hey, I do no harm. Well, that sounds great. Right. You know, I, I love nature. Well, who doesn't love a beautiful sunset, you know, or a, you know, cool mountain morning, if you will. <laughs> right. And and she believes in a, in a divine energy. The force, right? Exactly. Who hasn't heard of, of that, you know, since 1977, Star Wars and the force. And so, so she's trying to be appealing in, and, and she wants to sound good. But these things, mm. again, do not line up. I will argue with what does the word of God have to say about who God is, mm. how we're saved, who Jesus is, how do you have eternal life? How do you have forgiveness? What is grace? And the list could go on. And so I think we're called to examine ourselves. Also, mm -hmm. the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians that we are to test and we are to examine all things. You know, uh, I think it's important that whenever, you know, you hear someone share their, their testimony about anything, uh, this is what I witnessed, uh, and policemen will tell you this all the time, detectives, those who do forensics, attorneys will tell you all the time, that you never trust a witness 
until yeah. you test a witness. Right. You got to cross examine. You, exactly. You never trust a witness uh, until you test the witness. <laughs> and so the point is, is that, and, and that's and that's a good way to again deal with many areas of life. And the point is, is that sometimes if a Christian does not ask the Wiccan in this case, why are you a Wiccan? What evidence do you have that what you say, what you're believing, what you're doing, what you're, who you're following, what you're following, what you're practicing is legitimate? Now, what's happening in many cases is that I think we are in many cases, we are spiritual creatures. Yeah. And, and because we are spirit beings, because we've been created by God, who is spirit, Jesus says he is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. We have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. There's something that we're desiring Okay, in our heart and life. Which goes back to, you talked about the nuns, people that have left Christianity. Maybe they didn't get what they you know, needed in their mainline churches. They leave Christianity. There's still something there that says... They're searching. Yeah, there's something out there, which is why yeah. they're receptive to this. They're, they're searching, and, and if something is appealing, or if something sounds good, or if something sounds, you know, hey, it kind of fits, you know, my personal, you know, understanding of life, or my political views, or whatever it may be, then, then they will latch on to it. And so again... The, the point is this, we're called to examine ourselves, and then we're also called to examine all things. Mm -hmm. Next, I will argue this, we need to be able to present the gospel. So in this question, the, this, this parent asks, uh, what is this all about and what can we do? Well, I think Christians need to be able to know how to present the gospel. Amen to that. And so few Christians, if you were to ask them, could you lead someone to the Lord? Do you know how to share your faith? Do you know how to share uh, your faith in such a way that it would make sense to someone else and they could hear you present the gospel and then therefore believe. Mm. And so to be able to present the gospel or share why you follow Jesus, I think is crucial in today's world. But many who are in mainline churches in pews across our, our nation, if you were to pull them off to the side and say, look, I've got 90 seconds to live. Tell me how I get to heaven. Yeah. They would look at you in some cases, unfortunately, like a deer in the headlights. Mm. You know, we need to know how to present the gospel. Yeah. We need to know how to share the gospel because the reality is I have seen that scenario play out. I have, I have known of and seen of people uh, who said, I only have, you know, a little time to live. I know I want to go to heaven when I die. Can you tell me how to get there? Mm. And so that's important to note. And so many times we want to lean on our pastors, which is understandable, or our professional you know, ministers that, that know how to do that sort of thing, hopefully. Uh, but many times we need to learn how to do that. Uh, and so when you're presenting the gospel, you always go to the person of Jesus. So I would encourage this young man, if, he, if he's really concerned about where he is in his walk, if he's really concerned about what's going on in his relationship with this young lady who is Wiccan, um, always, again, present who Jesus is and present the things that cause us to believe in him and follow him. Right. You know, and, and there's five basic things, I think, that we need to look at and, and that we can share with anybody. Uh, again, the prophetic fulfillment of Messiah, that no one's life, death, burial, resurrection, miracles, birth, genealogy, was predicted except for the person of Jesus, the Messiah. You know, everything about his life, everything about his death, everything about his miracles, everything about, you know, what he taught was all predicted and all was fulfilled, you know, including the resurrection. You know, number two, uh, the miracles that Jesus did. You know, when, when you say to someone who is wicked, let me just tell you what, let me tell you what Jesus did. He raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind. He, he, he calmed the storm. He, he did all these amazing things, all the while claiming to be the one and only creator God of the universe. And that he who has seen him, talking about Jesus, has seen the Father. And the reality is these miracles were done and there were eyewitnesses and there is a written record. Again, eyewitnesses have been cross-examined, eyewitnesses that have declared and shared, you know, with their very lives who Jesus the Messiah is and what he has done. Uh, and the fact that he's risen from the dead, you know, I mean, because the reality is uh, Wiccans, like many other people, they have this spiritual hunger, this spiritual desire. There is nothing more amazing to share with someone than the fact that someone who not only lived and predicted their death and their resurrection 
raise themselves from the dead. Right. And then promises that they will raise their followers as well. Exactly. There's a lot of divine energy there. That's a lot of... <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of divine energy there. I mean, there's a lot, you know, to be said about that. And so instead of mm. worshiping nature, which many Wiccans do, I would encourage them, why don't you worship the one who created nature? Mm. And as you worship the one who created nature, you can now enjoy nature and be a good steward of nature. Right. Absolutely. You know, I mean, so many Wiccans think Christian Christians are, you know, the ones who are the polluters and the ones who are mm. the th- ones who throw litter on the ground and all these things. No, we should be good stewards of the creation of our Heavenly Father. Right. And so He is the risen Savior. And fifthly, He's promised to return. And He set up all sorts of signs mm. pointing to the fact that one day He would indeed return as the King of kings and Lord of lords, and whosoever believes in Him has everlasting life. So that is what we need to be offering to every community, but especially the pagan community, especially the Wiccan community. I know a lot of Christians, uh, unfortunately, they, they look down their nose at anybody who's pagan. They look down their nose at anybody who may be in some sort of coven or satanic cult or whatever. And I understand that, but the reality is this. Jesus went to the lepers, if you will. Mm, yeah. uh, Jesus you went to those who were the outcasts. He went to those who were, again, just no one wanted to have anything to do with. And he's one that, the woman at the well, if you will. I mean, he went to these individuals and he brought grace into their life. He mm. presented the gospel. Once you present the gospel... Then this Holy Spirit takes over after that. That's right. And so, and so, how many uh, have I heard that you've heard? Maybe, maybe in this listening audience, have heard of former Satanists, former Wiccans, former pagans who came back to the Lord or who came to the Lord for the first time. Mm-hmm. Because someone said, let me share with you what I believe. Let me share with you why I believe it. Let me share with you a better way, a stronger way, a more truthful way to know and follow God, to know and have this fruitful, abundant, you know, life-giving, spiritually joyful life. Yeah. Well, and Paul talks about that specifically. He says, how can they believe if they've never heard? And how can they right. hear if no one goes and preaches? Right. And that's, you know, exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. And, and I'm not a big proponent, if you will, of what I call dating evangelism. Okay. <laughs> right. You know, there's some people who are, I get it. I'm not going to, you know, discount. But the point simply is this, is that, you know, if you are in a relationship or if you are uh, involved with someone who has different views, eventually those views are going to have to come out. Yeah. Eventually, because what... It's an important part of a relationship. It really is, because what you believe determines what you say, what you do, how you see life, your philosophy of life. Mm -hmm. Uh, What you believe determines so many things about your understanding of relationship, uh, your morals, your values. The list is endless. So again, so what we have to offer, you know, as followers of Jesus to the Wiccan movement is that we know of God's amazing grace. And we want them to know it as well. We want to know of God's amazing love. We want them to know of the amazing hope of eternal life. The Word of God never endorses reincarnation. Right. Never endorses it. Uh, as a matter of fact, just the opposite. Uh, Hebrews 9, 27 uh, makes it very clear. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Mm. And so that is important to understand. And again, if a person really wants to have this unique relationship with the creator of the universe, you can. Because every follower of Jesus can have this amazing relationship with God of all creation. Yeah. So what happens is this. We need to sometimes you know, deal with our, our understanding of, of who we are, what we believe in, knowing that what we believe as followers of Jesus deals with all the issues of life. There's four things that everybody wants to know about whether you're Christian, Wiccan, atheist, whoever you may be. We want to know origin. Mm -hmm. Where do we come from? We want to know what is moral. What what is moral? What is morality? Uh, Again, this person says, I don't want to do any harm. Well, how do you define what harm is? Okay. We want to know what is our purpose in life? Why are we here? What's our purpose? And fourthly, we we want to know our destiny. Right. We want to know where are we going to end up? Uh, every day we hear of someone in our age range who has passed away, Mm. an accident, an illness, you know, some other situation or circumstance. Uh, and the question always is, where are they now? Mm. Or are they in a better place? Or, you know, are they, were they 
you know, saved? Were they followers of Jesus? Are they in heaven? Is there a heaven? And so all these things come into our mind, no matter who you are. And so origin, morality, purpose, and destiny are four things that we all want to know about. And all four of those things are found in following Jesus. Next, again, we must be aware of deception and false teaching. And unfortunately, it sounds like this young man is so enwrapped in this relationship that, again, he's perhaps allowed himself to maybe go down a road with someone where their beliefs are not Christian, uh, and maybe he's been deceived to believe that they are, or that the teachings are genuine, and they're somehow, again, lining up with Scripture, and the reality is, beware of deception, beware of false teaching. Mm -hmm. Again, there's an old saying that one of my mentors used to say all the time. He used to say, erroneous teaching leads to erroneous practice. Mm. Erroneous teaching leads to erroneous practice. Mm. So again, the, the point is this. Beware of embracing what the Scripture does not support. Beware of embracing what the Scripture does not support. Beware of embracing what the Scripture, in many cases, condemns. Because when we go down that road, we're setting ourselves up for failure. We're setting ourselves up for heartache. We're setting ourselves up to be, you know, uh, in a place that we never thought we would be. Mm. And so the main thing is know what you believe. Be ready to give a reason for what you believe. Encourage testing. Why do you believe what you believe? And again, the Bible says test all things. Yeah. Keep that which is good. And while we're doing all this, no matter who it may be, the atheist, the non-believer, the skeptic, the Wiccan, mm. whoever it may be, we're always called to show love. Mm. We're always called to show grace. We're always called to be willing to explain what we believe mm. without wavering. We're yes. not, we are never called to waver in our faith and to show them there is a better way, that this is not opinion, this is truth, and that the reality is you know, your future really is at stake. So these are some of the things that, again, I think we in the pulpit, we in other you know, Christian settings sometimes forget that there is a movement out there and there are several groups out there that do not line up with Scripture, but they are growing exponentially as the, the mainline churches are shrinking and as some of these groups are, again, expanding and, and growing. Well, and reinforces the, the need when you put it in perspective like that for us as Christians to not abandon the evangelistic push That's that it. you talked about earlier. Exactly. You know. Exactly. And so many are. And, and not only that, but to also, it makes it very clear also, too, that the pastor or the professional minister or the person on staff is not the only one yeah. that is to do ministry. For those who are listening, I would say maybe only 10% or maybe even less of those who are listening right now or somewhere, some way, somehow uh, on a professional staff at a church somewhere. Right. Most everyone who's listening right now, they're volunteers, they're Christians, they're followers of Jesus, they love the Lord. But the reality is that they're the ones who are coming face to face mm -hmm. with the people in their community, in their school, in their classroom, in their neighborhood, who are asking questions, who are struggling with faith, who are struggling with doubt, who maybe are contemplating, maybe I should get involved with this new Wiccan movement. It seems pretty interesting. You know, it's very, you know, pro-feminine. It's very, you know, pro-nature. Uh, you know, it seems to be a good fit, you know, for what I used to think about and believe in. And so they embrace it thinking, hey, this is a good thing. When all the while there is a level of deception because the reality is it does not line up with the Word of God. So for those of you who are listening, uh, know what you believe, know why you believe it, grow in your faith, be able to give evidence that demands a verdict. And if you hear of someone that's, hey, I need to know, I've got questions, please be able to say, I've got answers. Well, there you have it from the family answer, man. We uh, want to encourage you, please, please, please uh, do not abandon the evangelistic push because it is important and uh, you will make a difference in people's lives. We are glad uh, that you were able to join us today. We hope that this episode of the family answer, man, will encourage you and inspire you to make changes that will lead to a stronger, healthier, happier family.